Hey guys, welcome back to Fisher Hex. My name is Travis. Today's video, we're going to be talking about five ways that you can prevent coral death within your reef tank. Now, I'm going to be primarily talking about SPS and Acroporus because that's what we have here in the fish room and in the 300 gallon, but these same rules will apply to LPS dominant tanks as well as soft coral. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, let's go ahead and start with number five, which is make sure you're keeping stable water parameters and you're testing those parameters often. Now, what I mean by that is at least once per week or once every two weeks, you should be testing all the major water parameters for alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, nitrates, phosphates, temperature, salinity. Now, of course, depending on the type of reef tank you have, for me, with a 300, I test my alkalinity every Wednesday and Sunday, and then I test all the other ones uh, once per week, and then sometimes I'll push out calcium and magnesium once per month. It just really depends on how the tank is reacting off, so I might test it a little bit sooner, but that's pretty much the schedule that works for me. Now, if I had to pick a water parameter that I felt that was the most important, and those of you who have been following the channel for a while know exactly what I'm going to say, I would say that alkalinity is the most important water parameter, especially for those of you who are looking to grow SPS, and more specifically, Acropora. Alkalinity is by far the most important water parameter that you should keep stable within your reef tank. Now, one thing about alkalinity is it's not exactly a thing in the water. It consists of actually bicarbonate and carbonate. Bicarbonate, which is HCO3, is what corals uh, take up to process into carbonate, which is CO3, which then they use to build their calcium carbonate structures. Now, having stable alkalinity is basically an indication that there's enough bicarbonate in the water. So when the coral goes to lay down a skeletal structure, it has the appropriate amount to continue that process. Now, when it's not stable or if it's really low, you'll find that your corals are brittle. They'll break easily, even be stressed out to the point that they start to STN or even RTN, which is slow tissue necrosis or rapid tissue necrosis. So providing your reef tank with a stable alkalinity of around nine or 10 DKH is always best. Now you can do this between uh, calcium reactors, two-part dosing, or even calc loss but just be mindful of how much you dose at any given time because you want to also avoid those spikes from say going to 12 dkh because you overdose the tank down to a 7 dkh over the next couple days that fluctuation granted it is over a couple days can still be too much for those sensitive acroporas now, one quick thing regarding testing your water parameters, make sure you're testing with a reliable test kit. For me personally, I use the HANA checker for my alkalinity and my phosphates because I find that I need precise numbers for those particular water parameters. The HANA checker provides those without a doubt. Now, when it comes to calcium, magnesium, I like to use Red Sea. When it comes to my salinity, I will use the Milwaukee. I was using the uh, refractometer for a while, and I just decided to ditch that and move up to something digital that's a little, again, a little bit more reliable and doesn't need to be calibrated as often. Now, when it comes to my temperature, I like to uh, keep track of it with the Apex, but I do double check it with some temperature probes I have here in the fish room. Okay, number four, having the optimal PAR and spectrum over your corals. Now, when it comes to PAR, this is your photosynthetic active radiation, pretty much the overall intensity of the light. For me, when it comes to building any reef tank, mine, or clients, I like to stick around the 250 to 350 range. Again, regardless of what type of coral, all corals that I've ever grown have done well in that PAR range. Now, of course, some soft corals and acans and stuff like that don't really need that upper 350, and you can keep them sub 200, even sub 100 PAR, and they'll do just fine. But for me personally, having that range allows me to grow any coral I want, and I know it's going to be successful. Now here in 300 gallon, the very bottom glass is where I'm hitting 250 par, and then all the way up at the top, it's even 700 to 800 par where that coral is about to pop out of the water, and the corals are doing great throughout the entire uh, par range on the rock structure. Now granted, you don't want to take a coral from 100 par that you got maybe at a frag swap, and then go ahead and put it all the way into 700 par, because that stress alone between the intensity could cause a zooxanthellae to expel from the coral and bleach out and eventually die. So just just keep that in mind when adding new corals to your reef tank. Now, when it comes to testing PAR, I like to use the Senai Reef. It's relatively cheap, under $200, and it definitely serves the purpose. Now, if you don't want to spend $200, you can always go over to Bulk Reef Supply, rent one for $50. It's the high-end real PAR meter. And just make sure you have enough money in your account to put down the deposit that you'll get back once you return the item. Now, other than that, 
testing your par is relatively simple. I like to do it in the beginning of a setup and probably once per year, depending on the type of lighting. If I'm using more T5s and halides and stuff like that, I test it probably every six months just to see if the lights are either losing intensity or the spectrum's not the way it should be. Then I know that's a pretty good indication that I need to change out the bowls. But if you're just using LEDs, uh, testing once in the beginning, and if you're not making any changes to your programming or overall intensity, that's pretty much all you need to test. Okay, so let's go ahead and move over to the proper spectrum. Now, spectrum is different from PAR because spectrum is the wavelengths or the uh, color that's actually being produced from your lights that's reaching your coral. Now, they recommend that you stay in between 370 and 500 nanometers. In layman's terms, that means more violets and blues, deep blues, deep purples. That's what they mean with that particular nanometer range. Now, if you go into the ocean and you get down to corals, you'll notice that the only light that really reaches coral is the blue. Now, all the reds, the greens, the whites, all that stuff gets filtered out through the water, and we're left with the blue-violet spectrum, and that's what the zooxanthellae within the coral use to produce energy and continue to grow. So you might be wondering, then, why does my LED fixture allow me to adjust the greens, the reds, the whites, and the cool whites, as well as the blues and the purples? Well, that's more for us to personally enjoy our tanks. Those colors don't really do anything for the corals and the zooxanthellae to grow. It's more for us to visually light up the tank the way we want, so it looks the way we really think a reef tank should look. Uh, here on land so um, as long as when you're buying a light fixture you're able to get in that particular uh, 370 to 500 uh, nanometers those again those violets and those blues as long as you're able to get reliable uh, ranges within your LED fixture or even your T5s or any other ones you'll be able to grow coral without any problems now the reason why I talked about uh, PAR and Spectrum to prevent coral death is sometimes people buy really cheap lights that either they don't put out enough PAR, which the coral uh, is, is just not getting enough light in general, or they just don't have the right spectrum. Maybe they're using a plant bulb or something that they picked up at the LFS, and they really didn't think about the overall spectrum and what the bulb produces. So that's why I mentioned you want to make sure you have the right PAR intensity, basically light intensity and spectrum with color wavelengths to produce the proper light for your corals so they don't die. Okay, so here's a quick look at the Radeon settings here over the 300 gallon. Again, we have eight XR15s and eight T5 bulbs, four Blue Plus and four Actinic. Now, as you can see here, in the morning, it turns out at 0800, ramps up to nine where it gets at its 100% power now if you look here at the color i have 15 percent red 15 percent green 100 percent blue royal blue uv and then i go down to 25 percent cool white regular white or whatever white white stands for ww and then the 100 percent violet as i mentioned before when we talked about spectrum we want our blues royal blues uvs violets those are all going to be within that 370 to 500 nanometer and then of course we adjust the reds and the greens and the whites for what looks good for us now i have that run at 100 percent with no lightning no thunder no bullshit crap like that 100 percent with no dips all the way through until 2100 which is 9 p.m and then it ramps down to uh zero percent at 2200 and then it just continues that process at 8 a.m now this is what i consider my take on the AB plus spectrum on the Ecotech website with the difference between I don't have as much green and red as they do on their standard AB plus. Now I will link to that site in the description so you guys can check it out and learn more about the AB plus spectrum and all the colors within the radions. Okay, number three, another way to prevent coral death is to not buy corals that are outside your experience level. If you're just starting off in the hobby and you have soft corals, some LPS, hammers, torches, stuff like that, you don't need to be going out and buying Acropora or even some harder SPS corals. The reason for that is you're just not ready for them. If you honestly feel that you have a grasp on water chemistry fluctuations and keeping the, keeping the reef tank stable, then by all means, go ahead and try some of these harder corals. Just understand that they are a living animal and they aren't something that you should be just seeing and testing if you're able to do something. Now, uh, granted, I don't know if they have feelings or friends or families or, you know, even a GoFundMe, but it doesn't really matter. I would say uh, stay within your comfort zone and what you feel that you can successfully grow, build your knowledge, and then when you're ready, move up to some of the harder corals. Now, when it comes to those of you who are in the LPS world and you're looking to dip your toes into SPS, I recommend Montiporas, Digitatas, um, some Encrusting Monty, stuff like that. Those are really easy for you to get into. Uh, they're really forgiving on fluctuations. And once you get those down packed, move up to some easier Melipora type of Acropora, since those are the more forgiving of the Acropora species. 
Okay, number two, make sure you're trimming your SPS and your Acroporus to prevent coral death. Now, this is something that if you are in the SPS world, you're totally familiar with. When two different types of SPS come together, they kill each other. There's always going to be a winner, one way or another, no matter what you do. And here in the 300 gallon, you guys know that I go and I trim this tank every single week. Now, it is a pain in the butt. It's the part of the hobby and stuff that you guys just don't see behind the scenes. But every time, every week I go in there, I stir up everything, I break off huge chunks of colonies, and sometimes I have to remove entire colonies, which is the reason why we set up that 40 shallow reef, so I can put some of the colonies that I've had to remove because of corals killing each other. Now, it's really easy. All you have to do is go in there with a pair of bone cutters, snip off a piece that's getting close to another one. I kind of like to think of it as trimming the hedges outside. You can make them to, you know, I'm Edward Scissor's hands of the reef tank. I can trim all my coral to look whatever I, way I want them to look. So if, if it's growing in a direction you don't want, just simply go in there, snip off that piece, put it on a frag plug, and make a few bucks. Now, one thing to keep in mind is when you cut colonies, not only are you causing stress to the colony you cut, but you're also going to be pulling out alkalinity and calcium from the water column as the colony heals and the frag heals. Now, I recommend that you keep the frag in the water column in which it was cut from just until it heals. That way you have less chances of having excess stress on that frag so it doesn't die during the healing process. Also keep in mind that your alkalinity might drop due to how much you cut. It's going to be different for every tank based on the water volume and how much coral you cut. That's why I go in there every week and just cut probably 15 or 20 frags. I'm not going in there and ripping out you know, 50 to 100 frags because if I did that, then the tank would have a big dip in alkalinity, which in turn cause unnecessary stress, and we can have STN, RTN, and a whole shit ton of problems if I cut too much from this tank at one time. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to our number one thing that you could be doing to preventing coral death. Now, if you've been here for a while, you've probably guessed it, and that is quarantining your coral before adding them to your main display tank. Now, I've talked about this several times on the website. I've even made a video on showing you guys how to set up a proper coral quarantine tank. Link to that will be in the description, or you can find it in the description of any coral that I sell on my website. Now, when it comes to quarantine coral, it is so important to keep those pests out of your main display tank. There's one in particular that is the bane of anybody who has Acropora. It's called an Acropora eating flatworm. If you get these in your tank, so if I ever just threw a coral in here that happened to have the eggs on the base or something like that, and it got into this tank, this tank would die in a matter of weeks, if not a couple months. They will devastate a tank, and there's no known cure. There is some stuff in the works that's kind of being developed that might take care of them in the future. But having something as small as an egg come in that should have been quarantined, that I would have been able to find during that process, to com come in here and completely devastate my reef tank would be heartbreaking. And at that point, I'd probably take a sledgehammer to the glass and move on for being such an idiot and letting that happen to my main display. Now, of course, that is just one example of many pests that can either be a real nuisance or an eyesore to your reef tank or even go as far as devastating it like the Acropora eating flatworms. Now, a couple other examples of pests would be the Zoa eating spiders, the Zoa eating nudibranch, the Montipora eating uh, nudibranch, which are even worse. Those things are awful. The uh, flatworms, Asterina starfish, I mean, the list goes on and on and on of pests that could be easily prevented by simply taking the time to quarantining your coral before adding it to your main display tank. So guys, that's about it for the video. I hope you enjoyed it and found it to be somewhat entertaining. Those are my personal five ways that you could prevent coral death within your reef tank. If you have another one or you want to add to this list, feel free to put in the comment section so those of you who are searching the comment section can benefit from your ideas as well. Now, if you like the channel and you like the content I provide, Give the video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. I try to get one to three videos out every week. It's practically a full-time job trying to entertain you guys, but I like doing it. You guys seem to like it, so I'm going to keep going until something happens and I can't do it anymore. So until then, I'll see you guys later and uh, have a good weekend. Peace.